So why not just be a Christian? Why not just be one? I was happy as a Christian. The majesty and beauty of Genesis and Psalms moved me then and moves me now. The image of a stern but loving God who someday would right every wrong and dry every tear was a noble and inspiring vision. The hope of heaven and reunion with lost loved ones was a deep comfort in a world torn by tragedy and loss. Christian music from Amazing Grace to Beethoven's Misa Solemnis has a depth and majesty seldom achieved in other music. I am not a Christian today for two reasons, because I believe that Christianity is not good and that it is not true. For me, the first step from faith was, paradoxically, reading the Bible. Of course, I had known all along that the Bible contained horrific elements. In 2 Kings chapter 2, Elisha is jeered by some boys as he approaches the town of Bethel. Elisha curses them in the name of the Lord, and the Bible records that two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the children. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, the prophet Samuel, in the name of the Lord, orders Saul to utterly destroy the Amalekites. And I'm quoting from the Bible now. Spare no one. Put them all to death, men and women, children and babes in arms, herds and flocks, camels and asses. That's from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3. As I really began to read deeply in the Bible, I was shocked at how many atrocities I found. Could this be the word of God? What about Tom Paine, one of the founding, founding fathers of this country? Well, here's what he had to say about it, and I quote him. Whenever we read the obscene stories, the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel and torturous executions, the unrelenting vindictiveness with which more than half the Bible is filled, it would be more consistent that we called it the word of a demon rather than the word of God. It is a history of wickedness that has served to corrupt and brutalize mankind, and for my part, I sincerely detest it as I detest all that is cruel. Further, pat responses by religious apologists did not convince me. I simply could not believe that the Amalekites, even babes in arms, were so evil as to merit utter extermination. Second, though I had always known that Christian history had its dark side, when I really began to study church history in earnest, I was overwhelmed at the extent of the holy horrors perpetrated in the name of Christ. Even Christian historians, such as Paul Johnson, wax eloquent recounting <clears throat> the persecutions, pogroms, crusades, witch hunts, inquisitions, religious wars, etc., whereby countless people were burned, butchered, tortured, and imprisoned by God-fearing fanatics. In his recent bestseller, Hitler's Willing Executioners, Daniel Goldhagen traces the long, disgraceful history of Christian anti-Semitism. The hatred sown in Martin Luther's rabid anti-Jewish diatribes was reaped at Auschwitz. Forrest G. Wood's book, The Arrogance of Faith, details the complicity of Christians in the genocide of American Indians and in the defense of slavery. Christian bigots today continue to promote the hatred of gay people. Again, I was not convinced by the standard apologetic line about the holy horrors. I was told that the people who perpetrated such things were not acting in the true spirit of Christ or in accordance with the true gospel message. But my friends, this rang hollow. It sounded too much like the apologetics of academic Marxists. You ever run into one of those, academic Marxists? Okay. It sounded too much like the apologetics of academic Marxists who admitted the horrors of Stalin's gulag, but then denied that the Soviet Union was a true communist society. Surely, though, as Marx himself insisted, what matters is not abstract promises, but how a scheme works out in practice. In similarly pragmatic vein, Jesus said of false prophets, by their fruits shall ye know them. Indeed, indeed. Still, you might object, shouldn't we judge Christianity in its pure, revealed form rather than as practiced by notoriously fallible and sinful human beings? It is the original vision that counts, not its shoddy practice. Remember, though, that the monstrous doctrine of hell is part and parcel of the alleged Christian revelation. The greatest Christian thinkers and theologians, from St. Augustine to Jonathan Edwards, exhausted their vast powers of eloquence in their lurid depictions of hell. I shall spare the audience an account of these revolting fantasies, surely the most misshapen progeny of the human imagination. Even worse, all the most orthodox theologians, Catholics as well as Calvinists, insisted that one of the greatest joys of heaven is the viewing of the torments of the damned. Surely in the words of pain, such doctrines have served to corrupt and brutalize mankind. Cruel dogmas make cruel people. 
I hope that my argument has convinced you that a rational and conscientious person may doubt the goodness of Christianity, both as it is preached and as it is practiced. The Christian Bible is full of atrocities ordered or committed by God. Christianity produced St. Francis and Mother Teresa, but it also produced grand inquisitors and the authors of Malleus Maleficarum, the witch hunter's handbook. Today's Christian coalition dreams of a golden age when we truly have one nation under their God. History shows that a holy inquisition would be more likely than a golden age. Finally, Orthodox Christians to this day defend the outrageous doctrine of hell, a doctrine that represents God as an ogre, far crueler than any human despot. To me, then, Christianity is a bleak doctrine, one that has preached hatred, soaked the earth with blood, and filled the mind with supernatural terrors. I sincerely hope that it is false. Why then do I regard it as in fact false? St. Paul laid it on the line. In 1 Corinthians 15, 14, he says, if Christ was not raised, then our gospel is null and void. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not believe that Christ was raised from the dead, so I regard the gospel that proclaims him as null and void. My argument against the resurrection is simple. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The purported resurrection of Jesus is about as extraordinary as a claim can get. The evidence in favor of the resurrection is not good, so we shouldn't believe it. It is just a matter of common sense that we should place a high burden of proof on extraordinary claims. Suppose I had opened this talk by saying, I just flew in from Chicago, and boy, are my arms tired. Surely you would demand very good reason indeed before you regarded this as anything other than an ancient joke. Suppose that the Reverend Billy Graham solemnly assured you that the cow in the nursery rhyme really did jump over the moon. Surely you would demand hard evidence for such an outrageous claim, even coming from so respected and trustworthy a source. Once more then, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So why do I say that the alleged resurrection of Jesus was so extraordinary? Well, surely if we know anything about the world, we know that dead people tend to stay dead. Otherwise, why should we see irony in the following notice from our Department of Social Services? Dear sir, you will no longer receive food stamps because our department has received word of your death. You must inform us in writing within 30 days if there is a change in your circumstances. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Why are the reports of Elvis sightings material for the supermarket tabloids? Because we all rightly are very skeptical of reports of the resuscitations of corpses. The New Testament reports of Jesus' post-mortem appearances are even more extraordinary. Jesus was supposedly resurrected, not just resuscitated. His supernatural resurrected body could suddenly appear and disappear and pass through solid walls and doors into closed rooms. Surely a resurrected Jesus would be far more extraordinary than even a resuscitated Elvis. Here you might respond, wait a second, Parsons. Of course you, you atheist, are extremely skeptical of the resurrection. Like other unbelievers, you reject the whole concept of the miraculous, and you display a touching faith in the so-called laws of nature. I, however, you might say, believe in a God who can alter or suspend such laws at will. After all, the laws of nature don't tell us how things must behave, only how they usually do behave, unless, that is, God chooses that they behave differently. Therefore, you might say to that evil atheist Parsons, I do not have to rate the plausibility of miracle reports nearly as low as you do. But even if you believe in God, and even if you believe that miracles do occur, you must admit that the truth of any particular miracle report is initially most unlikely. After all, miracle reports come a dime for a dozen. It, hucksters and hoaxers abound, as do false prophets and false religions. So there will be very many specious miracle reports. As a glance at the New Age or occult section of any bookstore shows you, humans have a strong inclination to believe the extraordinary over the mundane. This is why we must repeatedly inculcate the maxim, when you hear a hoofbeats in the distance, think, aha, horses, not aha, unicorns. So, whether we are theists or atheists, our initial attitude towards any particular miracle claim must be that it is extremely implausible. This does not mean that evidence cannot, in principle, establish a miracle claim. It doesn't even mean that human testimony can never establish such a claim. It does mean that the burden of proof on miracle claimers must be very heavy. As David Hume put it in his famous miracle maxim, when someone claims a miracle, we should demand that their testimony be so trustworthy that its falsehood would be an even bigger miracle than the miracle they are claiming. Does the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus meet this heavy burden of proof? Nearly all of the so-called evidence comes from the four canonical Gospels, but let's be honest. 
What confidence can we have in documents, one, authored by persons unknown, clearly not eyewitnesses, two, written four or more decades after the events they purported to describe, three, drawn upon oral traditions and hence subject to the unreliability of human memory, four, each with a clear theological bias and apologetic agenda, five, containing many identifiably fictitious literary forms, six, inconsistent with each other except where one gospel plagiarizes another, seven, at odds with known facts, eight, with virtually no support from independent sources, and nine, testifying to events which in ordinary circumstances we would regard as unlikely in the extreme. Well, Professor Craig believes that there are three main points of evidence that support the historical case for the resurrection of Jesus, the post-mortem appearances, the empty tomb, and the origin of the Christian faith. In my remaining time, I shall explain why I reject each of these pieces of purported evidence. The post-mortem appearances. Professor Craig places much emphasis upon the formula recited by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8 where Paul lists various alleged witnesses of the risen Jesus. Cephas, Simon Peter, the Twelve, over 500 at once, James, Jesus' brother, all of the apostles, and finally Paul himself. This passage is important because it is very early, it names or refers to numerous alleged witnesses of Jesus, the risen Jesus, and it purports to give Paul's own testimony, the only undisputed first-person report of an encounter with Jesus in the entire New Testament. First, the early date of the formula is irrelevant. Contrary to a claim frequently made by Professor Craig and other apologists, legends can and do spread almost immediately, despite the opposition of eyewitnesses, and sometimes even with the connivance of eyewitnesses. Consider Elvis and Bigfoot sightings, Bermuda Triangle disappearances, alien abductions, crash saucer stories, and other such goofy legends. Such stories spread quickly, often despite the testimony of eyewitnesses and the efforts of would-be debunkers. Surely people are not more credulous now than they were in the first century. Anyone who insists that the resurrection accounts cannot be legendary simply opposes common sense. Getting back to Paul's testimony, let's get back to Paul's testimony. It gives no details. It does not mention the empty tomb, even though, in doing, so, even though doing so would have strengthened Paul's case. It gives no place or date for the alleged resurrection. The Gospels and Acts know nothing of an appearance of, to the 500. Surely they would have reported such a remarkable event. Paul does not make clear why the apparent, whether the appearances were physical or visionary. The Greek text, folks, is entirely ambiguous on this point. More importantly, we know nothing of the reliability of any of the so-called witnesses. How reliable were Peter or James? How do we know that the 500, if they really existed, did not suffer a mass hallucination? What then about Paul's eyewitness testimony? As T.H. Huxley noted in a classic essay, if we accepted all of the eyewitness reports of miracles from old texts, we would be credulous indeed. Is Paul then particularly credible? On the contrary, Paul himself states that he was given to ecstatic visions. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul tells us of being caught up as far as the third heaven, verse 2, and not knowing whether he was in the body or out of it, verse 2 repeated in verse 3. He reports that he was caught up into paradise, verse 4, and that he heard words so secret that no human lips may repeat them, verse 4. Clearly this is an account of a mystical vision. Why not conclude that Paul's experience of the risen Christ was of a similar kind? Now for the empty tomb legend. Professor Craig adduces, Paul, adduces Paul's testimony for the, in the 1 Corinthians 15 formula that Jesus was buried as evidence for the empty tomb. But reciting such a liturgical formula no more implies knowledge of an empty tomb than singing John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave implies knowledge of where John Brown is buried. Professor Craig also argues that had the stories of the empty tomb been, been fictitious, the prejudices of the day would have dictated that they be discovered that the accounts indicated that the discoverers of the empty tomb were men rather than women. But the gospel accounts say that the disciples fled into hiding with Jesus' arrest, leaving only the women to care for the body. Besides, the washing, wrapping, and anointing of bodies was women's work in those days. Therefore, it is utterly unsurprising that, the fictional account, that a fictional account would depict women as the discoverers of the empty tomb. More fundamentally, as, as the right Reverend Bishop Shelby, Shelby Spong says, quote, the discovery of an empty tomb would never have issued in an Easter faith. If there had been a tomb, and if the tomb had been found empty, it would have meant only that one more insult had been delivered to the leader of the tiny Jesus movement. The disciples, whoever they were, would not have concluded that, would have concluded that even the dead body of this Jesus had not been spared degradation. No Easter faith would have resulted from an empty tomb. Therefore, such a tradition cannot have been primary. It was but a story incorporated later into the narrative. Professor Th Craig's third main piece of evidence for the resurrection is the origin of the Christian faith itself. He argues that the Christian faith <coughs> is a in a resurrected Jesus has no precedent in Jewish thought. 
The Jewish conception of resurrection is a general raising of the dead at the end of time, not the raising to glory of a single individual as an event in history. Further, the Christian idea that the resurrection of the righteous will somehow hinge on the Messiah's resurrection was, was wholly unknown. Professor Craig concludes that these new Christian ideas were so radical that only the actual resurrection of Jesus can account for so extreme a conceptual shift. But according to the Gospels, Jesus' ministry contained many heretical elements. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus, is claim, Jesus claims authority for the forgiveness of sins, which elicits a charge of blasphemy from the scribes. In Mark 7, he sets aside the traditional dietary distinctions between clean and unclean foods. In Mark 2, 28, he even claims to be sovereign over the Sabbath. Further, Jesus' preaching was full of apocalyptic content. He famously said, Truly I say unto you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. In Mark 8.31 and 10.34, he predicts that the Son of Man will die and rise three days later. Given the heretical and apocalyptic nature of their master's teachings and the experiences, whatever they were, that convinced them that Jesus had risen, the emergence of radically new concepts in the disciples' minds hardly seems to require supernatural explanation. For the early Christians, the resurrection of Jesus was the first eschatological event, an event that ushered in the new age, the coming of the kingdom. They believed that they were in the end times. In all honesty, folks, I simply do not see here a gaping, unbridgeable, conceptual chasm between belief in a general resurrection at the end of time and the belief that Jesus' resurrection was the first event of the coming of the end times. In the, present, in the presently fashionable lingo, paradigm shifts do occur. If Professor Craig insists that nonetheless, <clears throat> uh, nonetheless such a conceptual shift requires supernatural intervention, I simply have to ask, what are his criteria? At what point do concepts become so alien that it would require a miracle for someone to shift from one to the other? We need some such guidelines before the discussion can proceed. In conclusion, H.G. Wells one time said, every dogma has its day. Christianity's day has been rather long, 2,000 years. I think that's long enough. Thank you very much.